It's the real news. I'm Aaron Maté. The first formal summit has been announced between President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin. The two will meet in Helsinki, Finland on July 16th for one-on-one -on -one talks. The announcement comes as Trump's suspected ties to Putin and Russia continue to engulf his presidency. And on that front, there is a lot going on. Well, joining me to discuss the latest in the Trump-Russia probe is Michael Isakoff. He is chief investigative correspondent for Yahoo News and co-author of the New York Times best-selling book, Russian Roulette, The Inside Story of Putin's War on America and the Election of Donald Trump. Michael Isakoff, welcome to The Real News. Good to be with you. So let me start by asking you uh, about your assessment of where we are in terms of what we know about the central question behind this entire uh, kerfuffle. And certainly it will be uh, revived now uh, in the wake of uh, Trump announcing uh, the summit with Putin next month, which is the, the, the extent of the ties between Russia and, uh, and Trump. And on that front, maybe you could also lay out for us um, what you go through in your book about what we know about Trump's ties to Russia. You start uh, much earlier than the 2016 campaign. So it, just your assessment sure. of what we know right now about this relationship. Well, first of all, I do think that the timing of this summit is pretty interesting because, uh, you know, my sense is nobody knows for sure, but that um, Robert Mueller uh, is is coming on, uh, coming to a critical juncture in his investigation with a lot of anticipation or expectation he's going to do something this summer, um, if for no other reason than you know, there's a consensus he he won't uh, do anything after Labor Day, uh, so he doesn't get accused of trying to um, interfere in the uh, midterm elections in the way that uh, Comey's um, uh, last minute intervention in the uh, Hillary Clinton matter um, affected that election, and he was uh, quite rightly uh, roundly criticized for it. So I think, given that uh, Mueller has been at this for some time, given the um, uh, the pace of his activity, the continued subpoenas, uh, the continued grand jury work, the the, the sort of vast scope of his investigation, I'm expecting that we'll be seeing something relatively soon. And the first sort of um, iteration that we, we're likely to see is um, some report on the obstruction of justice issue. Uh, whether or not uh, Mueller goes the route of uh, subpoenaing the president if he doesn't agree to um, uh, testify uh, or uh, submit himself for an interview uh, is an interesting question, and I'm not sure that M um, Mueller will um, go that route. Um, uh, he may just uh, go with what he's got, uh, submit a report to Rod Rosenstein, and then the question will be, uh, what does Rosenstein do with the report? He has the discretion to release it, to share it publicly, or, or not. Um, it's hard to imagine given that the intensity of the public demands for a uh, for all information on this he, that he'd be able to resist uh, a public release. Now that said, look, um, as we lay out in Russian Roulette, uh, this does go back to well prior to the uh, 2016 election. I mean, Trump for years had been trying to do business in Russia, as he'd been trying to do business in many parts of the globe, but he did seem to have a particular focus on Russia. We start the uh, account with the uh, our, our book with the account of the uh, uh, 2013 trip to Moscow uh, uh, for the Miss Universe pageant, where he forged his business deal with Aras Agalarov, uh, the billionaire oligarch who uh, is was close to Putin, had just gotten a medal from Putin a couple of weeks earlier. He was known as Putin's builder. Uh, and uh, uh, while there for Miss, the Miss Universe pageant, uh, uh, Trump... Uh, uh, signs a letter of intent to build uh, a uh, Trump Tower in Moscow. Uh, this went much further than anybody realized at the time, or even during the 2016 campaign. Um, uh, Donald Trump Jr. was put in charge of the project. Uh, Ivanka Trump flew over to Moscow in, um, 
in February 2014 uh, to scout potential sites for Trump Tower in Moscow with Emin Agalarov, the pop singer son of Aras Agalarov. Um, but what's in, you know one of the things that's interesting about this is it was all going fine until what happened just a few weeks later. Uh, that's when Putin annexes Crimea. That's when he intervenes in Ukraine. That's when the U.S. and EU impose sanctions on Russia. One of the sanction entities by the EU was uh, Sperbank, the Russian majority state-owned bank uh, that was going to finance the Trump Tower deal. What's interesting is that the deal collapses after the imposition of sanctions. So sort of as a starting point, if you're trying to understand where Donald Trump was coming from uh, on the issue of U.S.-Russia relations and sanctions, um, it's useful to note that um, sanctions pretty much uh, screwed up his uh, this long-cherished uh, project uh, to build a Trump Tower in Moscow. And I think that's um, uh, certainly something to keep in mind when one looks at um, Trump's uh, responses very early on to questions about sanctions. Uh, he was, um, uh, you know, was one of the first questions as we lay out in the book. Uh, he gets asked a few weeks into his campaign by uh, Maria Butina, uh, the suspected, uh, well, the uh, the aide de camp of uh, of Al uh, Alexander Torshin, the uh, uh, Russian central banker who's been uh, long suspected of organized crime ties, who'd been investigated by uh, the Spanish uh, uh, police for his uh, ties to Russian organized crime, uh, and um, uh, Butina tries nails him down very early on, saying if he's president, we wouldn't need sanctions. Right. But then when it comes to the central issue of, of coordination and this longstanding relationship between the two, which is a, a central claim of the Steele dossier, which you also write about. I mean, the Steele dossier contends that there is this uh, relationship between uh, uh, Trump and Russia that goes back many years. And in fact, it also says that the Russian government has floated real estate deals to Trump over many years, but Trump himself has turned them down. But how does how then does all that square with Trump trying to build a uh, a Trump Tower in Moscow twice and that not happening? But not because Trump said no, but because the sanctions, as you say, and then later on because he couldn't get financing from the Russian government. Well, I, look, I, I think uh, we uh, put the Steele dossier under a, uh, a microscope and give it some scrutiny uh, in the book. And uh, you know, I think uh, if you've uh, if you've read the, the chapter on that, um, we do raise questions about some of the claims in the uh, Steele dossier. Uh, certainly, some the sourcing is uh, is exceedingly murky uh, and and hard to you know it's hard to figure out what to make of it. And I think some of the 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 uh, allegations in the Steele dossier, you know, we simply have no evidence to support them. Um, but that doesn't um, uh, take away from a the larger point of the Steele dossier that there was a uh, a Russian effort uh, to cultivate Trump. Uh, there clearly was that. Uh, and um, but, and but as, Michael, how do we know that? Well, how do we? I mean. How do and we just, know that there was a Russian effort a to, Russian cultivate effort to cultivate Trump? And, and no, by the way, on the question of sources, uh, just the question of sources of steel, I, I, I did learn a lot from your book. You report that steel sources were, on the one hand, uh, secondhand in one case, and then another case, it came from uh, the, the lover of a Kremlin insider. And the word you use is pillow talk, as, as also the basis for another of steel sources, which uh, I found very illuminating. But yeah, but, but how do we know? that there was a deliberate Russian government effort to cultivate Trump, because this is the central question, or one of them. Well, uh, I think that there's a body of evidence on uh, this matter. Let's go back to um, the aforementioned uh, Alexander Torshin, uh, who is somebody who's um, clearly a Kremlin insider with close ties to Putin, who was making multiple efforts uh, to make contact with the Trump campaign, to set up meetings with the Trump campaign, uh, to set up a summit between Trump and Putin. Uh, 
during the election, um, who was in Louisville for the NRA convention and met Donald Trump Jr. Uh, There's a rather extensive email trail on this, and we uh, quote from some of the emails uh, on that uh, in the the book. Uh, Let's go back to the Aguileros again. Remember, Michael, you also note in the book... but you also note in the book that Torshin's efforts ultimately weren't successful. I mean, I think he met, I think you note he managed to meet with Don Jr. on the sidelines right. of some right. of the But you asked me, was there was there a Russian effort to cultivate Trump? And I think a Russian, the evidence a Russian, on Torshin, a Russian a Russian I, I, government. I, 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 a Russian government effort to cultivate Trump. And I think the torsion uh, in treaties and email trail is evidence in and of itself of that. But let's go back to the Aguileros, who uh, clearly had their own ties uh, to the Kremlin. Uh, you know, they uh, established this business relationship with uh, Trump in 2013. Uh, that continued. We talk about how uh, Trump and uh, and Emin Aguilarov stayed in touch. Uh, Emin Aguilarov visits Trump. Trump and Trump Tower in January of 2015. And then let's cut to 2016 and the email trail uh, that begins with Rob Goldstone's emails to um, uh, to Donald Trump Jr., uh, which were triggered by the Aguilaroffs offering documents, according to the uh, uh, according to the Goldstone email, official Kremlin documents that have been given by the chief prosecutor in Moscow to uh, Aras Aguilarov, passing them off to um, uh, uh, and, and then setting up the meeting, setting up the meeting at Trump Tower. That's a further evidence of a Russian attempt to establish relations with Trump, to cultivate Trump and Trump and the Trump campaign. Those people do hold Russian passports, but the question then is: that, Does that lead to some sort of high-level Kremlin conspiracy? And do you? dismiss the explanation that the participants in the meeting have given, which is that uh, basically Rob Goldstone got limited information from um, Emin Aguilarov, this this Azerbaijani pop star. uh, And all he was told is basically is that his father wanted him to get a meeting uh, for uh, some Russian colleagues of his. So Goldstone, uh, he said in his, uh, he's a publicist, he's a former tabloid journalist, he says he's, he's told Congress in his testimony that he used publicist puff to try to get the meeting for his client. And when he did. Yeah, uh, yeah and the, 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 the publicist uh, puff, as you put it, uh, appears to be the uh, offer of uh, incriminating information about Hillary Clinton. But let's let's put that aside for the moment. That's clearly what the Trump folks were interested in. That's what Donald Trump uh, Jr. Uh, responded to. If it's what you say, I love it. But look at the testimony of what took place during the meeting itself. It was about the Magnitsky Act. It was about lifting the sanctions imposed on the Magnitsky Act, which was at the top of the Russian government's agenda uh, at that moment. That's what the Russians cared about. That's why they were going to the Trump folks. And that's why they were cultivating the uh, Trump campaign in hopes that a relationship between the Kremlin and the Trump campaign would lead to the lifting of the hated Magnitsky Act. So that, right. that's in any way that the, the reality of what the testimony in the meeting was about supports the idea that the Russian government was reaching out to the Trump campaign. No, it supports the idea that some Russians who wanted to repeal the some Magnitsky Russians. Act. Excuse no, me. Well, Excuse well, me. So, so no, Russians, not, some random Russians. Where did they get the the? Uh, uh, where did the agenda come from? The Magnitsky Act. Where was that coming from? You know, it was. It, it, the email trail is quite clear that this begins with some conversation between the chief government prosecutor and Aras Agalarov, the. Uh, Kremlin-friendly, Putin-friendly oligarch who everybody, who the Kremlin knows, has this relationship with Donald Trump. So they were using their ties their, to Donald Trump, using Aguilarov's ties to build a business relationship to further the Russian government's political agenda with the United States, which was to get the Magnitsky Act lifted. 
I got, just, but I guess my point is just because an act was undertaken that uh, comports with the agenda of the Russian government doesn't mean it came from the Russian government. The, the lawyer, the, the key lawyer in that meeting, Natalia Veselinskaya, had been working on this issue for years uh, on behalf of her client. In our book, among other things, that shows that she was more than that, that she had an ongoing relationship with the FSB and, and had uh, represented the FSB's interests in, uh, in, in multiple cases. Right. OK. But if you believe uh, the testimony about what they discussed, then what do you say then to the testimony that basically Kushner and Don Jr. and Manafort heard all this, they couldn't understand what she was talking about because she was talking about uh, this Magnitsky Act and the, this ban on the adoption of Russian children that, that the Russian government imposed right. response, uh, and that Don Jr. And his, and his crew didn't understand what was going on, and so they ended the meeting very abruptly. And by the way, the information that was even floated to begin with um, had nothing to do with the information that we're all... That, is at the heart of this whole scandal because Goldstone in his, in his email offered uh, information, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but information on Hillary Clinton and her dealings with the Russian government that he said was incriminating. Nothing to do with stolen emails that, that would come out a few weeks later. So, I mean, if you believe the account of the, of, what, of the topic of the meeting, then do you believe the account of the result, which is that actually Veselinskaya had no dirt to offer at all? Um, that appears to be the case. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, all we know is what the testimony is about what took place in the meeting. Uh, but that doesn't take away from the fact that the Russians, uh, and I think there's, you know, grounds to believe, strong grounds to believe that the, that this was a Russian government inspired effort, uh, were reaching out to the Trump campaign and the Trump campaign, hoping that somehow uh, they were going to get dirt on Hillary Clinton that could be useful uh, for uh, Donald Trump's campaign, um, uh, eagerly accepted the meeting. Um, it is what it is. But I don't think, I mean, you're kind of being, uh, you know, uh, a, a sort of uh, effective defense lawyer here in that you trying to take each piece and then put it under a microscope and then sort of suggest, well, couldn't this explanation uh, take away from some of the larger thesis? There is a larger point here, if we can focus on the sure. forest from the trees. There I mean, was, in to, fact, I think I'm a massive... The evidence, but go on, yeah. Sorry. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was, in fact, a massive Russian effort to uh, uh, to interfere and influence our election. There was and a hack that, of the Michael, DNC. Michael, you say that. Hack the emails. There was a uh, there. There was this social media campaign by the Internet Research Agency. All of these things actually took place, and that Michael, was something seen, that was fast Michael, and unprecedented. Michael, have you seen any proof from 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 anyone from the U.S. government from any of your sources that uh, makes you believe that this was definitely a Russian government massive influence? operation. You wrote the definitive book on the yes. hoax that was the, the Iraq war. And I took from that that we should look at our intelligence community claims with skepticism. But in, in this case, you seem to be taking the opposite uh, conclusion. We, we still don't even have evidence that the Russian government committed the hack, but yet it's been sort do, of taken do you, really, do you really have questions in your mind that the Russian government was behind the hack of the DNC? You I, realize, I, I, realize, of course, that we've now had two administrations, one Democratic, one Republican, in which every single official who has seen the evidence, who has looked at this, has come to the exact same conclusion. Not only that, but now the House and Senate intelligence committees and the House Republicans, the House Republicans who have the most interest of anybody in trying to discredit the Mueller investigation, in trying to undercut the premises behind the Mueller investigation. The House Republicans, in their report, said that having reviewed the intelligence, they reached the same conclusion. The Russians hacked the DNC. The Russians gave the emails to WikiLeaks. The Russians uh, hacked the Podesta emails. The Russians gave them to WikiLeaks. So, I mean, there is no, the difference between this matter, the Russian attack on our election, and the um, 
clearly flimsy ca- uh, claims behind the Bush administration's case uh, about weapons of mass destruction is, it was very clear, even during the run-up to the Iraq war and became very clear afterwards, that there were multiple dissents from within the U.S. intelligence community, that there were uh, uh, whistleblowers who were trying to say this this uh, uh, intelligence doesn't add up. The information doesn't add up to what the political claims that were being made by the Bush administration. In okay, this case, I, in yeah. this case, hold on, finish. In this case, there's not a single whistleblower who has seen the intelligence, who has come forward to say anything other than what the intelligence community and the U.S. government officials and officials in two administrations, Republican and Democrat, and the House Oversight and Senate Oversight Committees that have examined the intelligence, they've all reached the identical conclusion. Now, you know, maybe you want to cling to the idea that there's somebody out there who actually has access to intelligence that actually has access to information that somehow undercuts that. And I'd be happy to listen to them. But we've been at this more than two years now, and no such person has come forward. Okay, Michael, two points. Uh, One is that we've heard all these conclusions. We have, and you're right, they come from a a, a sweeping body of people, but of government officials, I should say. Uh, But but all of it has been presented. Hold on. on Right. All of it has been presented with no evidence. The, the, the uh, intelligence assessment that came out in January 2017, there was no evidence to the public. So they tell us that they, they're confident that this came from Russia, but they didn't show us any evidence. So again, I don't believe we should just believe official claims, no matter how unanimous I, it I, is. I, I don't, I don't with, believe we should on, believe it. On faith. It, it, and my second it, point, and my second point, and then I'll let you respond, Michael. But my second right. point is that it's true that we have not seen any dissenting uh, intelligence officials uh, come out and say that the assessments were wrong. But we also know that this was a different process. You detail in your book how the Obama administration kept this whole, uh, during its deliberations about what to do uh, uh, when it first, when the attack, when the hack first happened and when the emails first started coming out. You report how the Obama administration kept this to a very small group of people. And we also know that the intelligence analysts who put out that report that everybody cites as the basis for blaming Russia, the one that came out in January 2017, that report, uh, in the words of James Clapper, the director of national intelligence at the time, the analysts for that report were, quote, handpicked. So he selected some analysts from, from, from certain agencies who put out a report that accused Russia with no evidence. So if you can respond to those two points, it's a it's, and, and and you yeah. think there was some sort of conspiracy to concoct uh, a phony claim against Russia that somehow everybody bought into every, those intelligence analysts they all bought into it uh, the uh, everybody who reviewed the intelligence the House Republicans that reviewed the intelligence they bought into it too uh, the Senate uh, bipartisan uh, Republican and Democratic staff staff members and and members, they've bought into this all phony concocted conspiracy. I think at some point, uh, you know, the 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 suggestion you're making really does stretch credulity. And by the way, there is multiple evidence that's out there, many that has been much of which has been cited by security researchers, but there was also Human sources, we talk about a human source back in 2014 who was warning about what the Russians were up to uh, on this, and we detail that for the first time in the book. There were intercepts uh, that uh, that made it clear the Russians were congratulating themselves on the job well done in uh, in leaking the um, uh, the Podesta emails and the, and the DNC emails. There is there a body of evidence. The, yeah, there well, I, 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 and there's a report on the source. And we reported those intercepts. And, and we reported report, those intercepts. There's a report. We reported a those report. intercepts. No, that yeah. report yeah. comes from us, okay? Okay. And, okay. and others. But I'm telling you, we spoke to multiple Did you see sources. the intercepts yourself? No, of course I didn't see the intercepts myself. So someone you know. told you about the intercepts. Well, you know, yeah. so, Some, someone, somebody multiple sources who are not political people, who are not trying to promote an agenda, who are not trying to start a phony war the way the Bush administration was doing in Iraq, 
people who were trusted, who were known, who were experts in this area. And, uh, you know, and, and so, and like I say, there's a body of evidence here. And, and just go back to why did the House Republicans buy into this? What, why did they well, accept 100 percent that the Russians this. I, this is almost not worth talking about any further anymore. I'd love to see more evidence just so, you know, people like you Michael, can go to sleep at night without Michael, being why, uh, without, Michael, like, taking yourself I apply that, Michael, Thank Michael, you. Michael, I can apply that same logic to the Democrats and their support for the Iraq war. Why did the Democrats support the Iraq war? Back, Not back in two thousand two, Democrats supported the Iraq War. The, the, yeah. the vast majority, the vast majority of them did, including but many of the Democrats who are now accusing Russia of carrying out the of carrying out like this interference campaign. So, so, so partisan uh, partisan like motivation sometimes. Uh, does not de define everything. In this case, you have a longstanding bipartisan consensus that uh, that that sees Russia as a threat and, and as an enemy. That uh, um, uh, that that confrontation with Russia has benefits to certain influential domestic groups, the military industrial complex. Uh, so do you think our it, sources from inside the intelligence community, our sources who are long trusted people who'd served in the U.S. government in multiple administrations had some sort of financial interest in promoting no, this? I'm in not order? Saying that. No, so but people, I'm saying that. No, but I'm saying the same mentality. What are you, what are you saying? The same mentality that may have led people to uh, 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 buy into phony intelligence before the Iraq war and many other cases. I mean, the intelligence community has a long history of cooking up intelligence to suit political imperatives. So that, that same dynamic may have been at play here. And I, I'm certainly not saying that's what happened for sure. And I think it's quite possible that everything you assert is true. Maybe the Russian government did carry all this out. I, I think we can agree, oh, though. But that, by no, the way... We do know that the Russians uh, have done this quite extensively around the globe. Go back to Estonia. Go back to what they did to in in, in Ukraine in 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 frying servers and shutting down the electric grid in Ukraine. Go back Actually, and look Michael, at their that's interference been disputed. in even uh, even that's been disputed. Uh, that's, Michael, that well, sure, the Russian strike. No, that allegation right. comes from CrowdStrike, which is a uh, which which has which, uh, which is has, what which is what a bunch of dishonest people who no, are trying I, to serve somebody's political they, agenda. They what strong, John Henry, he was chief of counter, uh, he was chief of cyber for the FBI. He's it's got a private some firm. It's a agenda? it's a private firm aligned with the Democratic Party. Uh, it worked for it on this analysis of their servers, they and they contract they're the ones, with the Democratic Party. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, founded founded I believe by a uh, by someone who is very openly hostile to Vladimir Putin doesn't like him. Uh, probably there are a lot of people who are well, sure, who sure. don't like Vladimir Putin. For sure, sure. Good sure. Reasons, but right? what I'm saying is I don't necessarily that I but but because they they might have but because they have political views that makes me at least uh, think that we shouldn't believe all their claims on faith without seeing. Uh, well, look, the, if you if you find a, a whistleblower, somebody who actually I'm knows trying. something, and that I, suggests trying. that anything yeah. you're saying has some validity, please let me know or publish it. I'll be happy to read it. Uh, I'll be happy to look into it. But all I can tell you is that you know we've been at this more than two years. We read, you know David and I wrote it, did a lot of research for this book, and you know nobody credible who we talked to suggested anything like the kind of conspiracy you're suggesting. All right. Well, we are out of time because I promised to have you out of here uh, in half an hour. So I will stick to that. But I, I, I hope you just let people know that there is a lot of information in our book uh, that, you know, this is not carrying water for any side. This is not uh, it, it's not a, uh, a political uh, uh, work of uh, polemic. It's a, it's reporting. We lay out sourcing. Uh, we put everybody under a microscope and scrutiny like the Steele dossier, like the way the Clinton campaign handled things, like the way the Obama administration handled things, as well as the Trump campaign. So um, I just hope people will um, consult the book and then draw their own conclusions. Well, and many people have already because it's a best-selling book. And I, I certainly uh, uh, agree that there's plenty of sourcing in the book. There's a lot of reporting. I learned a lot from it. I guess, actually, Mike, what I'm saying is I learned stuff that I think reinforces my skepticism of uh, of this entire affair. So I I, I think this book is is a, is incredibly important to understanding uh, this 
this entire uh, Trump Russia scandal. Okay, well, thank you. I'll take that. Michael Isakoff, chief investigative correspondent of Yahoo News. The book is called Russian Roulette The Inside Story of Putin's War on America and the Election of Donald Trump. Michael Isakoff, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.